So I just want to welcome everybody who's joining us live to the Cyber Risk Virtual Gathering and this is our last session of the year. It's been an, a crazy year and yeah, everyone has gone through so much but it's really, really amazing to see the community sticking together and still, you know, learning from each other and even having amazing guest speakers like Greg taking his time out to just share and impart to our community. So we are all so grateful and thankful for that. My name is Shamin Tan. For those who are new to Cyber Risk Meetup, I am the founder of CRM. We call ourselves the Cyber Riskers. And I'm also the podcast host of the Mega C Suite Stories. And at the same time, I'm also the Chief Growth Officer at Privasec, which is a local cybersecurity consulting firm in Australia and in Singapore and some parts of Southeast Asia as well. So what I really do is I work closely with execs in our industry and ensure that cyber risk is part of their business strategy for sustainable growth. Over the last few years, our Cyber Risk Meetup community has been meeting regularly like to exchange learnings and to hear from different industry leaders. In total, we have already more than about 3,000 over members in this community right now. Many of the sessions are also now on YouTube and on podcast. If you would see, we had a few very interesting sessions. But before I go into our past episodes, just want to welcome all of you here. We have members joining in from Sydney, from Melbourne. Brisbane, Perth, Singapore, and even our new chapter that we set up earlier this year in Tokyo in Japan. And previous episodes that we have had includes an interesting mix of people. We heard from board directors where they talk about what they want to hear and see from cyber risk leaders. We had chats with CROs, with a few familiar faces from the US. So Greg, I think you probably know a few of them. Uh, Dan and Steve, who's known as the world's first CISO. But today we are so excited to have Greg with us. Before I go on to introduce him, you know, it'd be good if you guys have missed out on the previous episode, feel free to catch up on Cyber Risk Meetup YouTube channel, or you can always just subscribe on the podcast. We are on Spotify, Apple, and, and all your favorite channels. All right. At the same time, just want to give a shout out to our annual community partner. And for today's episode, it's Recorded Futures. They are incredibly well known in the US. They have recently brought in their Threat Intel solution to this side of Asia Pacific as well. And I will play a short video intro while we give some time for the rest of the people to tune in. It's about a 30 second video just to give them some love. a short clip and if you want to find out more about them feel free to do that and check them out and our next community partners we just want to give a shout out to my security marketplace they are a really great forum where they keep us up to date with a lot of good content and also news articles and even all the latest events that's happening around the world so feel free to check them out also the company i work for privasec they've always been a great supporter for cyber risk meetups so a big thank you to them as well and they do a lot of work in grc rate teaming drone security they have built drone notify which is one of the world's first drone threat intel solutions so that's really interesting for those who are interested to check that out okay and last but not least our cyber risk meetup community supporters Cybersecurity magazine isaka city chapter of course and cyan advisors network so a big thank you to you guys for all the work you've been doing in the community all right, without further ado, so this session is, we want it to be interactive. So we have quite a few questions that we prepared for Greg, but in the meantime, if you have questions that you want to pick his brain on, feel free to type them in. You can see it in the chat box on your right hand side. So I'm really, really excited by the way to have Greg here. He's joining us here from the US and what time is it over there, Greg? Uh, it's a little bit after 8 p.m. on Wednesday evening. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, way after working hours. And I know you have to, you're just, we're just talking about you having to drink your coffee to make sure you're yep. still alert. You had a very early morning start. It's been a long day, but it's a good day. It's uh, 
It, it's very cold here right now. It's uh, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about uh, two degrees uh, Celsius. Um, so uh, we, we've had snow in the last couple of uh, days in our region. Wow, okay. That's very different from over here in uh, Sydney. It's very hot. Um, yeah, but then again, we're in summertime. But for those who are new to Greg, I, I believe shouldn't be because he's a very well-known figure and we're so excited to have him here. He's known as Brigadier, Brigadier? Brigadier General. General. <laughs> yes, that's right. Gregory J. Tuhu, and we call him Greg. And he is actually the president of AppGate Federal Group. He was previously appointed by President Obama as well as the first federal chief information security officer of the United States. And he comes with a whole truckload of stories that we can all learn from as security leaders. So thank you once again, Greg, for agreeing to be on our show. Now, as part of this blackout series, you know, if you can share with us a story of a Company that you have seen that have faced a cyber attack and if you can walk through what were things that they have done right and lessons that we can all take away well you know frankly as we were preparing for this I I thought of several of the different instances that uh, I've been exposed to and, and um, just to share with the audience uh, during my professional career, uh, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Communications at the United States Department of Homeland Security. And during that time, I uh, was concurrently the Director of our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, which is kind of like our command center for uh, cybersecurity and telecommunications in the United States. So I had the United States uh, Computer Emergency Readiness Team, the US CERT, uh, the Industrial Control System CERT, and a bunch of other acronymed organizations working for me. Uh, and, and you know, we spent a lot of time doing incident response uh, with our uh, computer emergency uh, response teams. Uh, and, and I was gonna talk about one particular entity that uh, re really got owned pretty badly. Uh, by a uh, an adversary group, but I, I think really today, in the aftermath of yesterday's uh, announcement by FireEye uh, mm. that they had been attacked by a nation-state actor, I think maybe that's more topical for right now. And and you know when we talk about trying to get things right uh, during a breach. Um, Certainly, I think there's a case to be made that uh, Kevin Mandia, who's a friend of mine, uh, Kevin has done an exceptional job representing uh, FireEye and uh, his company's brand. Uh, and, and further, going through the checklist deliberately as to what do you do when you've had a breach? Because frankly, mm -hmm. even a, a company uh, as well known and as capable as FireEye could get breached, and many have. Um, uh, Kevin, as the uh, CEO, made a public announcement. He owned it. He didn't make any excuses. He said, this is what happened. This is what we know about this. We are going to share with everybody. So uh, our experience is hopefully going to, to help others prepare and defend against similar attacks. I think FireEyes, uh, and really uh, Kevin Mandia is showing exceptional leadership in a times of crisis right now. Um, I think as a result of his proactive leadership, he's literally preserving the brand of that company whose stock could have uh, you know, fallen through the basement, uh, but has, uh, has held steady. I think today's closing, it was uh, down 11%. Whereas mm -hmm. in previous breaches, we've seen uh, stock plunge even deeper on the news of a cybersecurity company that's been attacked and breached. Uh, so lots of really good lessons to be seen today from uh, FireEye's response. Yeah, that's definitely a very current one as well. And everyone's all talking about it. And if you were to dive deeper into like a BCP, a business continuity plan, how does a successful BCP look like in action for the benefit of people who might be also newer to the industry? If you can walk through from the beginning all the way to post-crisis, what were some of the best BCP plans that you've actually seen? 
That's an excellent question. And, you know, frankly, uh, having spent over 30 years in the military, uh, continuity uh, of operations plans was built into our, our ethos, our training, and our execution. And some of the best business continuity plans have come from those folks who um, either retired from the military or just separated after their terms of service were up and, and joined the private sector and took a lot of that operational planning uh, experience with them. I, I've uh, seen in the financial services sector uh, some great uh, plans. I've seen in the uh, the medical sector now, a lot of folks are having to implement a lot of those continuity plans because mm. uh, in healthcare, we're seeing tremendous oh. amount of ransomware attacks. And, and one thing that uh, in the military, we say uh, the the time to exchange business cards is not during crisis. You should be planning ahead of time so that you understand what you need to do and who needs to do it. And to do it organically within your organization and just have your plan just within your organization and not with all the players that you would actually need to employ, such as law enforcement, mm. uh, third party partners, uh, all, all of that. You need to be thinking about a scenario that is your most likely scenario along with other uh, scenarios and build your plan around that what potentially could happen and what would you need to do? How do you benchmark against others in the industry, uh, folks that are like you? Mm. Um, I find that those that are very successful are very proactive and reach out to colleagues who are in similar uh, businesses and often competitors and say, hey, we're putting together our plan. We want to benchmark against uh, you and see what kind of experience you have. And on the same token, please benchmark against us. And um, here in the United States, we have a term called frenemies. Are you familiar mm. with that term? Yeah. <laughs> you, you become friends with people you're competing against. So frenemies, you know? So we go with our, um, you go out and you benchmark. You find th who's doing certain things uh, better than anybody else and you try to emulate that. So you build out your plan and you identify different scenarios that are most likely that you might face, but you identify what you have to do, who needs to do it, when it needs to be done, and then you rehearse it. Um, there are many companies out there that will actually help you build out your plans that will help you uh, test them as well and doing a walkthrough tabletop exercise that yes. involves uh, everybody who's involved in the execution of that plan is critically important. And where a lot of companies fail is when they don't involve the executives or the boards of directors in the actual exercises. And the folks that are doing extremely well are the ones that in, uh, the executives and the board of directors say, hey, I want to play in that exercise. I want to know what my role is in the event that we get uh, breached or we have a cyber incident, or you know, we just basically have a issue that could put us on the front page of the newspaper. So um, those organizations that I consider the most mature are the ones who invest the time in deliberate planning. They mm. train from the top on down as to what are the expectations and, and they continue that training. They do a lot of drills along uh, the way. It's not a once a year opportunity to, uh, to excel. You're, you're training every day to, uh, to succeed in times of crisis. So how often should they be running the BCP when you say training every year? And also for companies or businesses that are finding it hard to convince the board to get involved, do you have any advice on how they can position this? Well, you know, there's a couple of things. Let me unpack those questions. So um, when it comes to training, um, for the technical teams, um, I, I find through my research and talking with my, my classes at Carnegie Mellon University, um, 
we find for the technical teams, it's always good to have at least one drill for the technical team every week. You know, and it, it, it's uh, usually something that's just short, uh, it's a, a discrete task, and you're making sure that folks are maintaining their qualifications and can do their tasks within specifications, usually in terms of time and accuracy. So continual drills, a minimum about once a week. When it comes to uh, a, a much broader operational testing, uh, typically you don't want to have like a full stop test. You want to have uh, drills um, uh, of like the security operations center uh, at least once a month. Sometimes some organizations that have the bandwidth will go and do something like a, a, a SOC uh, drill maybe once a week themselves but at least once a month. And that's where you're gonna get the SOC in engaged. You might wanna set up a, a mini crisis action team to work through a scenario uh, tabletop. When it comes to the C-suite and the board, my recommendation is, is a minimum once a year. Um, and the, the really uh, intelligent organizations, the ones that are high on the learning curve, they, they generally do two a year. And uh, typically it's kind of like a walkthrough on, okay, so how am I as the executive team gonna be notified and under what conditions? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and literally testing the timing where you have, for example, uh, an exercise controller who will drop a card, you know, an exercise card and say, okay, Ms. Tan, you're in the, uh, the security operations center. Here's the scenario, exercise, 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 go. And literally, you track the time it takes to go through all the different uh, checklists. But one of the things you're testing is, is how, how long does it take to get up the chain of command so that the executives and the board can make the important decisions that they have to do. Further, um, one thing that I find is a best practice is bringing in uh, media consultants to help mm. train some of the spokespeople uh, to make sure that they know how to articulate the issues uh, properly. Um, yes. One of the things we did in the military all, uh, often, and I've seen it reflected in the private sector as well, as part of that training and exercise programs, we would literally hire folks from the local television station, um, not, not in their roles as TV reporters, but we would hire them as consultants to come mm. in and stick a microphone in the face of one of the lower level employees and say, hey, you know, I'm from channel two, what, what's going on here and see what they say. And that would help us gauge the quality and effectiveness of our training up and down mm. the, the chain. And, and typically you would wanna train the lower level folks not to necessarily talk with the press, but to refer them to the true spokesperson that has been properly trained and equipped to answer the, the questions properly. And that was something that uh, I, I find uh, was, uh, it was a training iteration that worked extremely well in both the public and the private sector. And from a board mm -hmm. perspective, board education needs to include cybersecurity awareness. And I'm finding here in North America, the North American College for Corporate Directors and the American College of Corporate Directors, two organizations that do uh, education and uh, credentialing for board of directors, both of them have now incorporated cybersecurity uh, training into their certification programs. Mm, actually, that's a very, very excellent, excellent point because in any businesses, um, they might be handling the crisis really well, but communication is key because if they, they don't have an effective communication um, approach, um, they're not getting the right message out internally and also to the public. And there'll be lots of speculation and assumptions and, and it's so damaging to the reputation of the business. So um, you've mentioned a really key thing, Greg, what are the top things then that you know, it's important for us to know, maybe even at the board level and at the sea level that, you know, they should be communicating to the media in crisis. Uh, what will be the key things that are important to note? Well, first of all, you have to understand your audience and your audience uh, is, as you mentioned, um, you, you have to make sure that you are communicating well uh, in the organization itself. Uh, so 
what I like to uh, remind folks is, is communication needs to go uh, up, down, across, and out. So as you are putting together your communication plan, think of it that way, you know, up, down, across, and then out. Um, so within the organization, typically you're, you're looking down uh, as far as figuring out what kind of uh, communication uh, management leadership is going to communicate down. But on the same token, you want to tell folks, this is the type of information I need when I'm up at the top. So you know, you want to make sure that the folks throughout the organization are thinking, here's the type of information I need to push up. Here's how I'm going to do it. And on the same token, from a leadership standpoint, you're going to uh, uh, communicate down. Now, across is critically important, too, because you want to make sure that you're synchronized across the organization. So you need to have a game plan in, in place for making sure that you have accurate and timely uh, sharing of information within the organization. Many organizations have functional uh, alignments, others have subsidiaries. So uh, having a communication plan that goes across is critically important. So we've talked down, we've talked up, and we've talked across. How about out? Most organizations have third-party partners. They have business-to-business -business relationships. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they're working with their, not only their business partners, but they also have to be very sensitive. And as a board member, we're very sensitive for um, our investors and our prospective investors. So we want to communicate um, when we're communicating out that we are demonstrating due care and due diligence. With due care being, uh, I, I like to define due care as doing the right things and mm. due diligence being uh, doing the right things the right way at the right time. So uh, as you're communicating up, down, and across, and out, you need to be factoring in. You've got multiple audiences, and yeah. uh, the timing, the methodology, and the messaging has to be carefully crafted for each one of them. And the time to craft that messaging, the best way to prepare is ahead of time. Yes, yeah, that's very important because like if you're preparing before time, you have the time and space to think properly and plan strategically without the pressure. Um, but very often when we wait till we are in the crisis mode itself, then that's too late. So this is really, really good what you're sharing. And Greg, I did promise our listeners as well, we have like we have prepared lots more stories. So can you share perhaps another story of a company who has been in crisis mode due to a cyber attack, but how have they done things very differently? from other companies and what are the different results and takeaway lessons? Well, I, you know, frankly, given the fact of some of the things that we did, uh, for example, um, with the U.S. CERT, um, I, I'm not at liberty to reveal the uh, identities of some of the companies because once a government official, uh, you know, exposes a company um, that, that was working with us in trust, it's not a good mm -hmm. thing. Well, let me share one example where we had a, um, it was during the OPM uh, breach, uh, the Office of Personnel Management here in the United States, where we had a nation state actor group uh, compromise a third party vendor to the Office of Personnel Management that uh, enabled the, uh, the attacking group to uh, puncture into the uh, government environment. Uh, so, the way that one uh, occurred was we had a employee in this company who went on to LinkedIn and some other platforms and was kind of bragging about themselves and saying, hey, I'm a, look at me, I'm a system administrator in this company and it's really important work that we're doing. And it got the attention of the nation state actors because it put out on LinkedIn, hey, you know, I've got all these credentials, I got all this access, I'm doing all of this, uh, you know, I'm a super system administrator. Well, the adversary group went out and they did the reconnaissance on this person. And they found out, yep, uh, this is what this guy does, this is where he's working. Um, and, and then they went and they, they did deep uh, looks into this person's background, his persona, and they found that um, he had had his username and password combination he had reused 
in several personal uh, accounts. And uh, that password uh, reuse uh, had been uh, harvested during previous breaches of commercial enterprises. So they saw a pattern of misconduct with this system administrator where the administrator had you know, freely surrendered his uh, password by reusing it. They went in and they attacked the company. They, uh, uh, they could figure out the username uh, just because the company on their website had said, oh, you know, if you have any questions, contact uh, Jimmy at, at this uh, address. And they figured out, here's the nomenclature for the usernames, easy. And since this uh, system administrator had a history of reusing the password, let's plug mm. in this password here and jackpot. So they, they got in, elevated privileges, moved laterally, owned every box on that company within three days. And uh, they went in uh, uh, through a VPN into the government enterprise, looking and feeling and acting like a legitimate user. Uh, now, we discovered it, we reacted to it. Um, unlike FireEye, that company, they argued with us. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one thing you don't want to do is get into an argument uh, in the middle of a crisis. You know, we, we had the data, we knew it, what it was. We, law enforcement, we were bringing in the law enforcement folks, we were collecting evidence, but we were in the middle of a counter espionage investigation. This organization got defensive and they started quibbling. Uh, mm. It did not go well for them. Uh, it, uh, they ended up uh, losing uh, their business. Uh, it literally, um, they, they were no longer in business. They completely lost their brand. Uh, and, and a lot of that was because the uh, executive team did not react well. They were not transparent. They, they went into a sense of denial and uh, they did not practice uh, ahead of time what to do in times of crisis. They, uh, uh, in the midst of a official government investigation into this espionage, they, uh, what, they used what we uh, in the United States called lawyering up. They, uh, uh, they, they put up lawyers and said, no, nope, you know, we're not going to cooperate with this investigation, and it's not, you know, it's not us. And we mm. had clear evidence that it was. And further, um, they they uh, would not provide us the logs that we needed to continue our investigation. And uh, we later found out that some of them deliberately uh, erased some of the logs in a, an attempt oh. to. Uh, cover, uh, this is my opinion, cover up. Um, and, and frankly, uh, when confronted by that, uh, what they didn't realize was, and this was uh, kind of silly on their part, 75% of their business was associated with government contracts. So oh. it really became an existential decision where uh, they, they ended up biting the hand that fed them and those government contracts were um, were terminated, and as a result, the company could not survive, and it was uh, it, it went bankrupt with, within uh, weeks after the uh, the penetration. Um, and every time I I drive past their building out on the Beltway outside of Washington D.C., I, I I see where they had taken down the sign for that company on the uh, ten-story building. Uh, That's really good. Yeah, they were not prepared. And they did mm -hmm. not know how to react properly in times of crisis. And, um, you know, one of the things that you want to do is, is you want to make sure that you, um, you, you don't tamper with evidence. That, yeah. um, you know, bring in the forensics folks. And the forensics folks will, you know, first things want to do is, is I'm going to want to mirror all your disks. I want to collect all the, uh, the logs. Um, mm. If, in fact, you have, are in the midst of a uh, a cyber breach, and your your national cert comes into play, or the law enforcement folks. You've you're uh, best served by being very cooperative, by preserving the evidence, um, mm. and 
And, and you know, most of uh, the organizations out there, they're very sensitive about getting you back online as fast as possible. So, you know, for, for my US CERT team, we'd go in, we'd mirror all the stuff that we needed to do, and then we'd get you back online right away while we conducted our investigation. Because every uh, moment that you're down, that's a uh, time where you're not making money or you're not executing your mission. So mm. cooperate with the certs. Uh, don't temper with the evidence. Make sure that your logs are intact. Uh, mirror everything and then get back to work according to the plan. That was uh, pretty much a textbook of how we address things. Mm. That's a very key lesson as well, because at the end of the day, it's important to Take ownership if the breach has happened integrity is key and you want to cooperate definitely because if you think about the other businesses as well if the same thing ha happens to them it's all part of like helping the ecosystem like the more we are honest and transparent about our mistakes the ecosystem grows together as well and learn from it and i find that as an industry the industry is more forgiving when you look at companies that have gone through breaches and gone through crisis but what's more important is their response and they see how they act after having that breach uh, what did they do right and if they conduct themselves well in a manner that that shows responsibility ownership and a desire for a real change and to uplift their posture after that they actually end up setting a, a role model for other companies who haven't gone through that whole phase so that's what i generally see and and, and you know frankly information sharing is critically important because if if in fact you're sharing that information, not just with the law enforcement and the investigators, but uh, through information sharing uh, organizations. We call them here in the United States, the Information Sharing and Analysis Organizations, or ISOWs. You know, you're, you're making the community better by sharing uh, what, what you found. I call that the Cyber Neighborhood Watch. And I mm. think we all should be taking good care of our neighbors, just as we are, should be taking care of ourselves. And um, you know, going back to the FireEye, uh, you can go on to GitHub right now, and Kevin Mandia and his team have posted uh, their initial data right there on GitHub. So you can go out on GitHub and see um, uh, all, all the data that they're putting in, the CVEs, the IOCs. Uh, it, it's, it's a good start. But I think mm -hmm. every organization, regardless where you are in the world, is, is if you see something, you should say something. And we have a responsibility to our neighbors to help um, build our cyber community and make it stronger. And, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be uh, sniping at each other. We should be trying to make sure everybody gets better because when we do that, um, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Yes, well said, Greg. I really love that. And it's all about together we are building the culture and also creating the right mindset for people to follow after. So we are going on to our last question. And I just want to open it up to the floor before I dive into our final questions. The rest of you, if you have questions you want to pick Greg's brain on, this is your time. Um, on to the last question, at least from my end, Greg watched you at a symposium and obviously you've been giving a lot of great talks and, and speeches as well and i thought given your experience and also the observation of the industry what are your thoughts given that we're in such a turbulent times what do you think 2021 is going to look like if you have any advice for businesses that they should be investing in from a cybersecurity point of view what would the top three things be well and i know I it's different for different companies but as a general opinion of the industry Okay, well, you know, I, since I'm a general, I can give the general opinion. Uh, so a couple of things. First of all, um, the vaccines aren't going to uh, take effect overnight. So uh, let's plan in 2021, uh, continue to plan that this work from home type environment is really going to, it was already starting even before COVID, um, but start your start your mindset uh, for 2021 that it's not going to be just a work from home, it's gonna be a work from anywhere environment from here on in. Um, people aren't necessarily gonna always wanna go back to that office model. And even if they do, it's not gonna be the full time, you know, five or six days a week. So think about, it, we need to provide a work from anywhere environment. And with the rollout of 5G, that's gonna be accelerated even further. So that's the first thing. 
Um, second thing, um, I, I think the investments in on-premises um, hardware and software, that, that, that's not a good investment for right now. I think you're going to see the as-a-service models, uh, platform as a service, infrastructure, and software as a service. That's, that, that's the state of the art right now, and it's going to continue. Uh, so I, I think you're going to see uh, more and more folks that are going to say, you know what, I, I don't want to have all these custom things. I'm just going to go and uh, go with an as a service model because it's much more elastic. It's faster to deploy. Generally, the service provider is going to patch and configure much better. But if I go on-prem or if I go buy hardware, I own it forever, pretty much. And I, I, I can expand it only by buying more stuff, but I can't contract it. So I think you're going to see more of the as-a-service model. And, and then, um, you know, frankly, I'm thinking, you know, I'm seeing, uh, given the fact that we're going to see more and more folks going into the cloud and software as a service, that really, that increases the demand to uh, move to zero trust because yeah. um, your information's everywhere. And frankly, there is no outside or inside anymore. Um, mobility, uh, cloud, it, it's all shattered the paradigm of the perimeter security model. So I'm gonna see more and more people go into zero trust. And as we discussed prior to our audience arriving, you know, mm. I'm seeing a lot of folks going with software defined perimeter technology, replacing VPNs because VPNs are they're, they're probably older than you are. Uh, you know, they came out in 1996, same year as the Palm Pilot. There's been so many different vulnerabilities announced. Um, yeah. you know, I've counted over a dozen in the last six months of uh, VPN vulnerabilities. So I think uh, you're going to see more and more folks uh, uh, pivoting over and implementing zero trust as they move into the cloud and SaaS models. And I'll give you a bonus fourth one. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more actor groups, uh, malicious actors, uh, that could be criminal groups uh, predominantly, but you know, there's some nation state actors that are uh, sticking their noses in it. Um, they're not necessarily uh, spending all their time and money trying to break into the big enterprises. They're going in through the back door with the home uh, systems. And we're certainly seeing that in healthcare. We're seeing mm. it uh, yes. intellectual property theft where they're not going against the front door. They're going to the home system, uh, generally, which are older. They're not uh, patched and configured properly. Security personnel are not monitoring them because they're home systems. You got multiple users on them. You know, gosh knows where the teenagers are going when you're not using the machine. You know, there's all yeah. sorts of different factors there. And uh, as a result, uh, we're seeing cyber criminal groups going after the home systems and using that as a back door. And a great example is we've seen agent Tesla malware repurposed with a keylogger to specifically look for VPN username and password credentials to get back into the enterprise from a home mm. system. Go figure. Wow. Mm. Gosh. Well, that's a lot of good pointers. And I think you're quite spot on on quite a few observations because it's pretty much what businesses need to be better prepared for. We just have time for one question. And uh, there's quite a few questions actually, but um, all right, we'll pick one. <laughs> so um, this came from Amit and he wanted to go back on what you were sharing earlier. Like if you have actually come across scenarios where logging was not enabled in the endpoints and it was identified during the investigation. So while this has been a common problem, he wanted to understand if this is the case with highly secured government organizations as well. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, in the, in the government, uh, we, we made it a requirement to uh, maintain our logs. And frankly, when I was the CIO of United States Transportation Command, um, we, we had seven years of our logs so that we could use uh, big data techniques and we could literally go hunting um, through seven years worth of data. I think right now, it's, since it's been about seven years since I uh, retired from there, last I checked, they had about 14 and a half years worth of uh, logging. So in, in the government, um, uh, at the federal level, uh, we were doing a much better job. Now, as the CERT uh, went out into the private sector, it was uh, a mixed bag, Ahmed. 
And we found that a lot of organizations uh, were not, in fact, uh, holding on to their logs and retaining them. Many of them were purging logs or rewriting over them after about 30 days. And given the nature of cyber operations and campaigns uh, by malicious actors, both nation state and criminal groups, you, you lose a lot of data, you lose a tremendous amount of forensic ability, and then moreover, uh, you lose a lot of capability to identify uh, and attribute the actors themselves with uh, when you don't have those logs. So um, I, I encourage you, uh, pass the word to all your friends, you know, make sure that you are in fact uh, logging and that you're retaining those logs. And um, many people say, well, you know, how much retention should I uh, have? And it really depends on your risk exposure, you know, within the, um, Within the military, I, I could afford to keep the, the log data because, uh, you know, frankly, uh, storage was increasingly inexpensive uh, and very elastic. But every organization is going to have to make their own decision. Ideally, you want to keep at least six months to a year. Uh, and if you're facing campaign action, uh, you may want even, even more than a year's worth of data so you can uh, do your proper forensics. That's great. And that's a perfect timing you have, Greg. We have exactly reached the end of our session. Um, I always love talking to you because you have, you're so rich in terms of a wealth of expertise, experience and stories. Um, and, and, that's because uh, I'm old. No, <laughs> it's not that. And I'm just so thankful that you've taken the time to just share and impart all these lessons learned and insights with all of us so a big thank you to you again greg and thank you to all our cyber risk listeners as well who have tuned in and have been extremely engaged in this session this will be made available to the rest of the community as well so ch check it out on the cyber risk youtube channel and i think that's a perfect way to end our last session for 2020 so fingers crossed it's going to be a better year next year and we look forward to seeing all of you in 2021 and hopefully we'll be able to see Greg in person as well once the borders open. You never know. So <laughs> fingers I look crossed. Forward to it. I look forward to it. And a, a, a special shout out of thanks to you for your leadership and, and to my colleagues in the ISACA chapter in Sydney. Uh, th thanks for all you do down there for, on behalf of ISACA and our community. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a great, great community we have over here. So thank you once again, Greg, and have a good rest of your evening. <laughs> very well deserved. Enjoy your night. Thank you very much. And uh, happy holidays and Merry Christmas to you all. Oh, thank you. And thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.